Um, as you're probably going through the sessions, you would have realized that um, a lot of the sessions are sort of focused on uh, different aspects of being a, 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 you know, a successful HR or L&D professional. Uh, our session is a little different. Um, our focus is a little different. We are going to focus more on the, the human side uh, of uh, human resources, if you will. Uh, sounds, sounds quite obvious, uh, uh, one would say, but really speaking, what we, are what we believe is that uh, an organization that creates the right culture within, uh, within the organization, uh, creating the right ethical culture within the organization is the one that is most uh, uh, sort of likely to succeed. And the, these are some of the thoughts that we want to leave with you in today's session, where we'll talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, creating ethical spaces and also the role of l and in uh, impacting the bottom line uh, of your organization. Uh, so today's session, we are kind of, uh, we have two parts to it. Um, part one is going to focus a little bit about uh, creating the right uh, environment and right culture at the workplace and with a particular focus on uh, prevention of sexual harassment. Part two is uh, a little uh, something that has been very uh, dear to my heart personally, but also to uh, all of us at Rainmaker. We are all very passionate about it. We conducted a survey called Safe Places to Work Survey, and uh, we want to walk you all through what that experience was. We also uh, have some of the winners of the survey here, so we'll also announce that in the second part of the session. Uh, so without uh, uh, sort of taking up more time, I want to dive straight in. Um, what does an employee seek the most at work? What do you all think it is? Quickly, work satisfaction, respect, freedom, freedom to do your own work, right? Okay, wonderful. Recognition, opportunities, engagement, salary, of course, very important. <laughs> but not that important because which is why it came up later on uh, in uh, in sort of everybody's thoughts. Anything else? Interesting work, of course. So. Uh, the, uh, based on uh, sort of a lot of research that we did, a lot of surveys that were conducted across, uh, across the world actually, not just in India, some of the key factors that uh, motivated people at the workplace, and it may or may not surprise you, but have a look, recognition, uh, to be recognized for what we have uh, brought or achieved at the workplace, appreciation, right, uh, pat on the back, it doesn't always have to be appreciation in the form of an increment or a raise, but just a pat on the back sometimes goes a long way. Uh, an inspiring vision. A lot of um, uh, people who took the survey actually said that uh, uh, for, for them, having a leader, not just the CEO of the company, but even a leader uh, you know, in, the, in the CXO level or even below, even a manager who had shared the same values and uh, had an inspiring vision was something that uh, really made them want to continue to work in that organization. Right? Uh, another interesting aspect was feedback. A lot of employees said that we, we actually crave feedback. We want to know what we have done well and what we haven't. And it's not necessary that that feedback has to be in the context of an annual or a, or a biannual appraisal. Uh, the more the feedback, the welcome, of course. Uh, I, guess, I guess the caveat is that feedback shouldn't always be negative. It's nice to receive positive feedback or a pat on the back as well once in a while. But this is something that came out as very, very important. Uh, growth opportunities. And this is where the, the compensation piece kind of fits in because growth uh, leads to greater compensation as well. Not really something that was compensation. Surprisingly, not very high on uh, on most people's minds when they thought when they thought of the right or inspiring place to work in or the best workplace. But uh, growth is one of those things, and of course, opportunity. I think uh, most of you had covered off these points. Opportunity as well, the opportunity to grow, the opportunity and freedom to do different things uh, and achieve more at the workplace. Right now, there's something missing here, which one of you had mentioned which was basically the outcome of, of that survey was that this is what you, the, the round circle that you see in the center. That is the single most important factor for most employees. Actually, you had answered the question earlier. It's respect. Every employee wants to be treated with respect, right? And that is increasingly becoming the most critical aspect of employee engagement, employee retention at the workplace. Um, a lot of employees said that they don't mind not moving to another organization for greater role or greater pay as long as they were treated respectfully at this organization. The surprising thing is that um, a lot of people felt that the, sometimes many people who were well treated at an organization didn't even want to take the risk of trying out a new organization. They may get, they may get a better role or expanded role or more money, but that, that trade-off was simply not worth it in their minds. So that's basically what uh, 
as you can imagine what employees really seek at the workplace now here's another one for you what what is it that disengages or switches off an employee biases okay what else lack of interaction managers sorry ma'am disrespect yes lack of motivation lack of trust lack of flexibility lack of clarity of communication yes ma'am wonderful sometimes monotony role clarity sometimes monotony also sometimes monotony of work of course that's very important uh, nobody likes to do the same work day in day out and no feedback okay wonderful so let's take a quick look at uh, so in a, in in, in a sort of surveys that were conducted there were two questions that were asked among other questions one is um what would what number of employ what percentage of employees this is the data that came out of the survey a certain percentage of employees spent a significant work amount of work time ruminating on the bad behavior which means if they had been treated badly by their manager or a colleague this percentage of people actually spent time thinking about it that's the first first one second one is that percentage of people accepted during the course of the survey that they deliberately reduced their work effort because as a consequence of disrespectful or bad behavior now let's look at the percentage of people and it might surprise you any guesses on the first one 60 and 70 for the uh, ruminating on bad behavior basically i call it sulking right people just say they've got a shellacking or a shouting at by the manager they go into their corner sit and they just sulk that's what happens to that people and it's most unproductive any other guesses on how many what percentage of people sulk 80% 80% people sulk huh? 8 out of 10 okay ma'am 80% any other numbers lesser more 20% 50s okay so let's have a look at the num this number uh 80% right so 20 is correct 20 is the number that actually doesn't sulk <laughs> 80% of people actually spent their time sulking about being sort of uh, disrespectful uh, disrespectfully treated at the workplace right so that's data point 1 now this is even more interesting right somebody might just sulk and then forget about it and go right then they get back to work this percentage of people accepted that they deliberately reduce their work output meaning either they just don't work for 6 hours 8 hours whatever they don't hand in there or the quality of the work product reduces whatever it is what do you think that percentage is 90 60 is there there's a 90 here and there's 60 to 70 here 50%, 50%? okay anybody else 100 100 everybody <laughs> So that's all of us in this room then. Okay, so that number is not that high. I think uh, uh, the number is close to fifty percent. It's forty-eight percent. But well, not that high, relatively speaking. If you look at it, one in two people, one in two people basically go back to their desks and probably either are completely unproductive or just sulk about it and then uh, deliberately reduce the quality of their output. Now that's very surprising. Uh, and what it tells us is that human nature is such that if treated disrespectfully people aren't going to give you their best they're actually going to give you shoddy work now extrapolate that across an entire organization which employs hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of people and you can actually get a sense of uh, how much productivity is lost to the organization runs into millions of dollars crores of rupees you name it but that that amount is incalculable actually which is why an lnd professional or an hr professional in an organization can really make a big impact by increasing productivity of of that organization so we'll just have a little deeper into that now sexual harassment is one of the main areas where um uh, sort of uh, there's a lot of uh, it's one area where there's been very very high uh, sort of numbers in terms of uh, uh, harassment cases right so um they say that uh, reports say that almost 45% of all harassment complaints which includes harassment bullying mistreating 45% of those are sexual harassment right mostly women but now in today's day and age also there are men who are experiencing sexual harassment as well so almost 45% of all harassment claims are sexual sexual harassment right um 
at least 25% of women experience sexual harassment at the workplace. That's probably not a surprising stat, I think. One in four women uh, at least experience uh, uh, in some form of sexual harassment and we'll kind of dive a little deeper into that. 75% um, of harassment victims experienced retaliation when they reported. Right? So now that gives you an insight as to why people are not reporting. Because if you, if you as a complainant report a case of either sexual harassment or harassment and you immediately get a backlash either from HR that says hey listen don't pursue this let's figure out a way to stop it or some uh, senior person starts putting pressure on you to withdraw the case or worse you're ultimately taken off a project or whatever it is or maybe even asked to leave that word actually spreads pretty quickly in an organization before you know it most people are saying hey listen in this organization there's no point filing any kind of complaint because there's nobody to listen to you there's no objective body that will hear your complaint and give you justice so don't bother ultimately what that does is it leads to attrition and loss of good people right so that's a very critical uh, uh, metric approximately 90 percent of employees experiencing harassment do not file a formal complaint that was very surprising to me i didn't realize that of course this survey is a couple of years old and i suspect if we were to do another survey now you might find that more people uh, are sort of coming up and uh, filing uh, uh, sort of uh, harassment complaints because as we all know the millennials are uh, entering the workforce in in, uh, in hundreds and thousands and lakhs so they are all uh, less likely to hold back in case uh, they experience harassment but that said a lot of them are actually don't bother filing a complaint they just let it go right now here's the bottom line the bottom line is all of this costs an organization right it is it, it you pay a heavy price for it uh, the cost of mishandling harassment complaints can be very high. The brand reputation of the organization takes a beating. Uh, high attrition rates. Management and HR bandwidth is sucked up into all of this. right? And as a consequence, all of this ends up affecting the bottom line of the organization. You have unhappy people. You have a brand that gets tarnished. Think, um, think uh, Terry, for example, in, if you're thinking sexual harassment. right? You think of Terry or you even think of... Infosys and iGate uh, when it comes to Mr. Fanish Murthy or any of those things. The brand really takes a beating both externally and within the organization, right? People then start to think that, wow, this is an organization where you can actually get away with a lot of stuff. So uh, basically these stats are to kind of give you a sense that the price that an organization pays is very heavy and very, very uh, unquantified, which is the reason why not many organizations are actually proactively taking measures. Quite a few are now. But the price that you pay is so high that uh, and it's, it's not been quantified by anybody in, in, in a strict sense, which is the reason why uh, a lot of people or a lot of organizations still don't pay enough attention to creating the right environment at the workplace. Right. So um, again, just to continue on that same thread, many 75% uh, of people who experience sex based harassment, which is gender based harassment, not just necessarily sexual harassment, uh, their typical uh, response is to avoid the harasser. Uh, sort of particularly I think in India this is more true where we are uh, sort of non-confrontational as, a, as a, a sort of a race or a culture. 73% uh, tend to downplay the gravity of the situation and 70% attempt to ignore, forget or endure the behavior of the harasser. So basically our chalta hai attitude is also reflected in the way we deal with harassment complaints which is basically to let it go what's the big deal or I don't want to confront somebody and be known as the difficult person right. So basically uh, uh, it, it can be safely said that approximately 70% of individuals who experience harassment, again, not just sexual harassment, but harassment, uh, never even talk to the supervisor or a manager or potentially even HR. Because the idea is, this is how the workplace is. So I'm just going to suck it up and deal with it, right? Uh, <clears throat> so what would be the objective of an L&D professional or an HR professional at the end of the day in terms of what is the goal, right? What are we... What, what is the objective of uh, the organization uh, in order to ensure that all of those sort of objectives are, uh, are met? Uh, training and awareness, basically sensitizing all employees about appropriate versus inappropriate behavior, right? This is critical. And uh, again, Rome wasn't built in a day, so this is not something we are, we are talking about sort of changing uh, mindsets that have been created over time. But this is probably the first step in sort of creating awareness amongst uh, the employees that's your base level of foundation then you move to the manager sensitization where <clears throat> you have orientation sessions where managers are specifically taught on how to create a respectful workplace and that starts with every manager 
as they say, people never quit companies, they quit the manager, right? So ma manager sensitization is another key aspect of ensuring that you build the right culture at the workplace. Then managers have to be taught on how to manage conflicts. Many times, a lot of cases of harassment or sexual harassment actually need not go uh, sort of reach the level uh, it ultimately ends up reaching if managers are able to deal with it. Particularly, let's let's sort of keep sexual harassment aside, but particularly those cases of harassment and bullying. If managers were proactive about ensuring that they created a respectful workplace, then incidents of harassment and bullying at the workplace will significantly reduce. Of course, sexual harassment is also linked to training and awareness. So it, it's linked to the entire organization being sensitized uh, in, in that respect. Um, very important, today people talk a lot about it, right? Challenging biases or unconscious bias. <clears throat> a lot of those things are also key when it comes to explaining or making your workforce understand that diversity is to be embraced, right? We live in a very, very uh, sort of intertwined, integrated uh, uh, world where it's not just about uh, you know different pe people from different backgrounds, economic, social, caste, religion, uh, so, and in a lot of organizations, we have people from different parts of the world as well. So all of all the, the entire workforce has to be sensitized and trained to embrace diversity and realize that working uh, with people from diverse backgrounds today is a way of life. There is no there's no shortcut to it that the old old uh, way of working is over. Today you have to accept the fact that you're going to have a lot more women at the workplace. You're going to have a lot of people from different backgrounds. Um, in Delhi, you might have people working from uh, from South India. From in South India, they have to accept the fact that a lot of people from the north are going to be working in Bangalore and Chennai and so on and so forth. So it is an integral part of the complex world in which we live in today, in terms of the workplace. And of course, lastly, very important, and I think uh, I don't need to sort of say this. This does, but a culture of speaking up is important. Uh, and I know I I'm sort of. Uh, uh, stepping on something a little controversial when I say that a lot of organizations actually do not want this culture. They don't want the culture of speaking up. Uh, but in the long run, in the sort of um, uh, environment and world we live in, it's better to have a culture where employees are encouraged to speak up. But they're also trained to uh, sort of trained in a way that they speak up when they believe that it's uh, it's necessary to speak up, not uh, uh, not over escalate as as one would call it. And this has to be backed up by a strong redressal mechanism, which means uh, if, if somebody has a grievance, there has to be a proper uh, process in place with uh, people who are who have uh, sort of the right credibility, uh, manning either the or womaning for that matter, the, the committee, whichever is the committee that looks at grievances, redressals or even your posh committee that's called the internal committee. All of that is very, very important. And lastly, a very strong anti-victimization and anti-retaliation policy, which means the organization should have zero tolerance for any form of retaliation because most people do not file complaints or escalate matters because they're afraid of retaliation by the management or, or by the organization. So that's the sort of, uh, that's what I would say is the um, final aspect. So therefore all of this is possible if the organization comes together as a whole individuals joining hands with the management to ensure that the workplace has a better culture, right? Okay, so that's a segue into part two of our session, which is really about the Safe Places to Work survey. Uh, in our, in our, our belief is that an organization that is, has the right culture, uh, is a safe working environment for women, would also uh, most likely and automatically have a respectful workplace towards all employees, right? Um, that said, uh, with uh, with the law coming in place, the Porsche law that was enacted in 2013, uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, you know movement that uh, uh, happened within corporate India. Corporate started to actually invest in, uh, in 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 sort of putting in place the right framework for training and Porsche and all of those things. But of course, um, it was probably not until uh, 2017, around the Me Too movement, and there thereafter that the entire uh, compliance side also got a real push, right? Um, nevertheless, uh, according to Government of India, there's been a 54% 50 increase in the number of SH cases from uh, reported between 2014 and 17, almost two cases reported every day. Uh, this is probably not a bad thing in the sense that I think it's more as an outcome of the 
awareness creation that is happening and in fact i would i would go as far as to say that if this number spikes over the next couple or two or three or four years that's also probably a good thing because that's all that's all stuff that's in there but has not been uh, brought out uh, over the years so uh, that's that's something that you're likely to see our objective was to um, uh, ensure that uh, we covered as many organizations from different sectors and geographies across the country varying in strength domains etc and of course evaluate organizations on the degree of safety and inclusiveness at the workplace so this was basically our objective uh, in conducting the survey we realized that we did not have all the answers to everything and we probably uh, will improve even further from the first survey that we conducted but uh, what we wanted more than anything else is to ensure that uh, those who are taking the survey, the, the women who take the survey in organizations felt that the survey was going to be objective and unbiased and of course anonymous. And that's the reason why we also had a panel of uh, members who advised and guided us on the best way to do this. So it was not just uh, five people in Rainmaker sitting together and saying, hey, we're going to do the safe places to work survey and this is how we're going to do it. We got advice from people. So Dr. Helen Joseph, um, who is uh, who's currently at, uh, sort of on a number of panels uh, uh, with respect to Porsche, uh, the IC member. Uh, she's also uh, retired from Nirmala Naketan and is, is basically somebody who is very well respected uh, in this area. Mr. Vivek Patwardhan, again, I, I guess he needs no introduction, um, uh, head of HR at uh, Asian Paints for many years. And uh, Sandhya Menon, who is uh, basically an activist. So what we try to do is get a, get a group of people, um, academic, uh, somebody from the corporate world and somebody from uh, somebody who's an activist to try and ensure that there was as much of a uh, sort of blend and representation from different uh, sort of walks of life if you will and all of them uh, sort of uh, in 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 no uh, sort of small way they played a large part in ensuring that we were guided the right way when we carried out our first safe places to work survey right okay so how did we, uh, how did this, uh, what is, what is the sort of thinking behind the survey? We had, uh, uh, <clears throat> the methodology was basically we had about 31 questions. Uh, although 31 sounds like a, a large number, it took no more than 5 to 7 or at best 10 minutes for somebody to complete the survey because they were all multiple choice uh, questions. And um, uh, so the questions can be broadly broken up into the following. Uh, A, harasser profile, which is basically who's the kind of person who does who has been uh, who is harassed uh, let's say a respondent who said that I've been harassed right so the kind of profile one question with five choices where it ranged from a colleague to a supervisor to a vendor to a client etc then the second question the second category was level of trust what is that level of trust is basically you're asking the participant or the respondent how much trust do you have in your organization right do you trust your organization to do the right thing do you trust your IC? So those are the kind of questions that we had in section two. Uh, and, sorry, it's not moving. Yeah. The third question related to the level of awareness. How, how much awareness was there amongst that uh, uh, group of people in that organization uh, with respect to their rights, what should they do, uh, particularly with respect to Posh, all of those things was, uh, there were five questions. Uh, with respect to the level of awareness that the employee had. And of course, the heart of the survey was the degree of harassment that an employee or a participant faced. So for those who, who answered in the affirmative saying that, yes, we have faced harassment, there were 22 questions with three choices. Those 22 questions, uh, three choices, basically yes, no, and uh, uh, maybe. Now, um, the the uh, the... 22 questions can be broken up into different types of harassment. One is, uh, you can, if you start from the top, physical. Well, has there been any kind of physical harassment? Touch, unwanted touch, or uh, you know anything on those lines. Second was abuse of power by a senior professional, somebody senior in the organization. Um, whether it's uh, seeking or soliciting sexual favors in response to uh, sort of getting the right uh, promotion or getting a bonus or what have you, right? So that is the second category. The third was visual, which is the most common really, uh, you know, the, the staring, the elevator look, all of those things kind of fell under visual. And of course, last is verbal. Uh, uh, basically unwanted comments, dirty jokes, 
uh, wolf whistling, pretty much everything kind of fell under the verbal bucket. Um, so, so this was basically the broad contours of how the respondents were asked to take the survey. Right? Now, <clears throat> here's the, here are the highlights. So we are, we are actually going to release a more detailed re uh, report on this within the next day or so, within the next 24 to 36 hours. But broadly, we have sort of crystallized the highlights of uh, the findings that we got out from this survey. So um, they're broken up into four parts, saying something which is verbal, doing something which kind of uh, could include abuse of power and or physical. Uh, sorry, doing something was physical, abuse of power. Sorry, then I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Physical is covered, abuse of power is covered. Um, Saying something, I think doing something uh, relates to visual. Anything that that you do without actually uh, sort of uh, saying uh, or verbalizing it. Um, now, of all the respondents, 27% of respondents claim to have faced some sort of harassment either occasionally or very frequently. So that's basically the one in four metric that we had previously discuss, uh, discussed, right? Um, and here you can see how the uh, how the metric breaks down. Under occasionally, it is basically largely verbal and visual, which is, the, which is kind of the common form of sexual harassment at the workplace, right? Abuse of power was a little lesser and physical was kind of uh, a little less than. Both were under 10% each. Uh, when you move to very frequently, those respondents who, who responded by saying that I have been sexually harassed very frequently, the numbers change a little bit. Uh, the abuse of power goes up. Um, because that's where the frequency increases. Uh, physical still remains the same. It's under 10%. But verbal and visual are kind of around the same mark. Right? So that's sort of uh, the kind of, uh, if you can bracket it, that's the kind of uh, harassment that people have faced. Now, I've, I've got, um, we had divided our uh, responses into four regions. North, South, East, West. What you see there, 22% is sort of, uh, uh, the four uh, regions will come into those four circles, right? 22 being the lowest, relatively speaking, and 33 being the highest. Anybody wants to take a guess as to which region comes under here? Yeah? South? Is there a lot of South Indians in the room? <laughs> South? Yeah. South and East is what everybody says. It's interesting. Let's find out the answer. It's actually where we currently are. West. So um, again, look, this is a sample survey. So this is not to be, you know, sort of uh, uh, used to uh, uh, sort of have conversations with, with our uh, colleagues from other regions to say that, hey, you are from there and so on and so forth. But we found that uh, uh, in our survey that uh, the least amount of uh, sort of sexual harassment experience was in the West region. 23%, very close. Now, South, South and East. So lots of South Indians and East Indians here. East and South, okay? Uh, actually, the answer is South, very close to uh, West. Uh, then, so nobody is, nobody is, nobody is for North. I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I, I grew up and studied in Delhi. Okay, so that's East and ultimately that's the North. <laughs> so, um, so that's basically the trend that we, that we have been seeing. Uh, sort of uh, in the responses uh, that we that we had collected. Um, now here's another interesting statistic. We had made it very clear to all our uh, respondents that the survey was completely anonymous, right? And that there was no way it was conducted on Survey Monkey. There was no way that anybody in your organization would come to know. Yet, one of the questions, key questions as to who did you face sexual harassment at the hands of? Manager, colleague, client. Surprisingly, 62% of the respondents did not wish to identify that. Maybe some lurking fear that somehow this information is going to go back. We don't know. But 62% did not identify. 2% did not even answer that question. 36% did identify. And that breakdown is as follows. Okay? So the 62% consciously chose not to identify. Your 36% who identified it said harassment at the hands of superiors, not surprising. 12% um, said by colleagues, peers, etc. So a lot of the verbal and visual harassment is likely to have happened in this, uh, in this area. 
5% said clients. So there are a lot of clients who are actually soliciting uh, 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 sort of uh, sexual favors. And I just got uh, a note that I have five more minutes to wrap up. And 2% others, maybe vendors and so on and so forth. So that's the sort of breakdown of um, who are the harassers, so to speak. Yeah, Zinovia. Uh, little under 6,000. Um, now, here's the other thing, age. We also were looking at the age of the respondents to figure out whether age is a factor, right? Uh, surprisingly, age is not that much of a factor actually. Sexual harassment cuts across all ages. So 15% of the respondents in the age group above 56 said that they have been sexually harassed. And this is the breakup of by age. So the most harassed were those in the 24 to 35 age group, right? Uh, a little below that are those in the 18 to 25. Then a little below that, 24% or a quarter of the population is between 36 to 45 and 46 to 55 for the last set. So actually looking at it, it's kind of evenly distributed across age groups as well. Although you can see that more than uh, almost 57% are sort of in the 18 to 35, sort of the youngest bracket, so to speak. Um, across departments now. Now this is interesting. Any guesses as to where the most amount of which department the most amount of harassment happens? Sales. Sales. Actually that's what we also thought and maybe when we do next year's survey it might come out differently but the most amount of uh, harassment actually happened in the finance department. Finance is 31 but the lowest was IT. Then marketing and sales. Right? So this was a little surprising to us as well. Then operations, although it, it is to be noted that the largest percentage of respondents were from operations. Then HR, <laughs> and then finance. The munshis uh, took the cake basically. Okay, so uh, employees in the finance departments are least aware of their rights, have the least trust in the organization. I don't think there are any finance professionals here, right? and have the highest rate of harassment. So uh, this was this was basically, these are the three factors that came out in, in, uh, in this uh, metric. Um, does marital status matter when it comes to sexual harassment? No, doesn't matter, right? Just like age? Kinda, but mostly no. Um, out, of the, out of the total who said they had been harassed, those who were single were 32%. Those who were separated were 38%. Probably there's, there's something uh, in that which says that, okay, if you're separated, then maybe you're available or we don't know what it is, but, um, and of course, 25% uh, of those who were married. So maybe uh, the Indian harasser thinks that uh, maybe married women I should probably not harass and let's go for the single and the separated ones. I don't know, but this, this is what the data threw up uh, as well. So. Single women are 30% more likely to get harassed than married women. Um, okay, so that's, uh, yeah. Now we also got some data on hierarchy and harassment levels. So 22%, the lowest was among leadership. That's not surprising because nobody's going to harass a, a, a powerful person, right? So, uh, but the stats get a little interesting now. 25% uh, are executives and mid-management. Right, so that's kind of your lower to mid management. 35% are senior management. So our guess is that basically um, senior senior executives, not leadership, but a tier or two below that, may be experiencing harassment at the hands of the leadership. Possibly that was the only way we could kind of justify the fact that there are so many such a high percentage of senior leadership women actually said we have faced harassment. Yaruna. Executives are junior executives, right at the entry level. So 25 to 31, they're basically your junior to mid level. That's about 56% is largely here. Not surprising. Leadership is also not surprising. This is the metric that took us a little by surprise because frankly, we thought that we'd see a greater spike in junior executives and mid management, right? So our, uh, our data is uh, sort of up on the, the, the report is going to be published shortly. So do have a look at it and um, 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 you know, download it and go through it. 
Okay, so this is these are the organizations that uh, uh, we are uh, we are proud that they participated in the survey and also prouder to note that most employees, all the women who responded to the survey responded very, very positively to say that these organizations had done uh, a sort of a fantastic job of creating a, a safe workplace. Again, of course, uh, so let's, let's, while we celebrate for this year, I'd also uh, urge the organizations to work harder to ensure that, uh, you know, this sort of, uh, we continue to maintain this even for the year uh, forward. Uh, so uh, AirSeva, which is an Airbnb company, we have Anamika Chauhan from Airseva. We have Cactus. Uh, we have Upasana from uh, Cactus. And Yashmi, is Yashmi here? Then uh, Cygnus Data Matrix, Dr. Ankita Singh. Did she make it? Congratulations. Edu Christine. Uh, Rati Nair, that's you? Okay, congratulations. Edureka has, uh, uh, could not make it, but we'll give them a round of applause anyway. Future generally, Ms. Shweta Ram and Aparnagar, right? Harbinger Group, Mr. Neville Postwala and Ms. Ruby Bakshi, thank you, congratulations. Okay. Uh, Little more enthusiasm, please, because they have created a safe workplace. So let's appreciate all of the work that's gone in. Thank you. A medline, uh, Mr. Ritesha and uh, Sonal Margin. Thank you. SBI, Mr. Atul Kumar and Mr. Prashant Pitkar. Thank you, sir. By the way, this is in an alphabetical order. So there's 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 no ranking. We, uh, we realized that most organizations were very, very close. And uh, rather than sort of having a ranking, we wanted to celebrate what all the organizations have achieved. So this is in alphabetical order. Uh, Tata Chemicals, Ms. Zenobia and Aruna, thank you. Times Internet, Ms. Arunima Sinha. And a visionary RCM, Ms. Renuka Devi and Mr. Vimal Kumar. Um, so we have uh, all of your collateral, including your certificates. We'll we'll have a we'll have the distribution outside uh, of the uh, sort of uh, uh, where the lunch is is going to be served. So I'd like to meet all the winners outside where we can hand over the collaterals as well. And uh, everybody else, thank you very much for making it for this session. Really appreciate the time that you spent. Thank you so much. Thank you. For such insightful questions. Can we have a big round of applause for Anthony? Thank you.